morning. I don't have anything quippy to say. I was up all night trying to think of something funny, but it just isn't there. Maybe I'm a serious man now that I'm 54. Um, the last two sermons that I've done have been related to the topic of prayer. Um, and so today is going to be my final installment, probably. Um, initially, I discussed prayer and its role in our sanctification, talking about how prayer is how we can express to God our dependence on him, our thanksgiving to him, as well as allowing us an avenue for seeking his will and his aid. I discussed that as we do our part to grow in wisdom and maturity, we want to be moving in a direction where, humbly, where we are humbly depending on God um, for his power to work in us, sanctifying us, conforming us, transforming us um, into the image of his son. And again, prayer is how we can express that dependence on God, um, our gratitude to him, and seek his aid. So I talked about, about how Paul's prayers for the churches that he wrote to in his epistles focus largely on things like their love abounding, or that they would be pure and blameless, or that they would be filled with knowledge of God's will, that they would bear fruit, that they would be given the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God better, or that they would be enlightened so that they may know the hope which God has called them. So definitely less of a focus on material things, even when praying for the, the, the I can say this word in my real life, um, Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians um, 1, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Paul boasted that they were persevering in the faith and that they were enduring persecution and trials. But at least in that instance, he didn't even intercede to pray that the persecution would end. He boasted that they were enduring the trials, but not that the trials would cease. However, he did pray that God would, be, would make them worthy of his calling, that by God's power he may bring to fruition their every desire for goodness, and that Jesus would be glorified in the Thessalonians. We also talked about praying continually and how if our attitude moment by moment is a prayerful focus of steadfast and continual prayer, one could see how our own focus could begin to mirror that of our creator. Then in March, I talked about strategies you could utilize to enrich your prayer life, like planning for prayer, creating a system to pray, avoiding mental drift, utilizing prayer models, journaling, um, and accountability. I mentioned that there's not one w right way to do it, but suggested these things or strategies as ways to catapult, enrich, or energize your prayer life. We also discussed some common myths related to prayer, like the marathon myth, the idea of praying longer and harder with the intention of manipulating God to act, or the persistence myth, manipulating God through annoying persistence, or the myth of numbers, the idea of manipulating God by having large numbers of folks praying to the same end. Faith and faith, the idea of manipulating God into an act, acting just because we want something really badly. And finally, the formula myth, this idea of manipulating God by ending your prayer with, in Jesus' name, or something of that sort, and treating that formula like a magic send button. And I closed out that sermon with a short look at proper reverence to God in our prayers and in our lives in general. Today, I want to take a closer look at some of the specific prayers prayed by Paul in his epistles with the hope of instilling a clear understanding of what Paul felt was important to go to the Lord in prayer for. I'm going to look at four different verses or sections of verses. First, 2 Thessalonians 1, 1 through 12, followed by 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 through 13, Colossians 1, 9 through 14, and finishing with Philippians 1, 9 through 11. So first, oh, slides. Other slides? There. there. I added some new Jesus pictures. All right. Jesus is a senior picture. Um, so first, uh, our first, second Thessalonians 1, 1 through 12. I'm going to read if you want to open up your Bibles. Um, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the churches or the church of the Thessalonians and God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love of all you, of, of all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecution and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, 
and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back, back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to, to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with, the power, with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy pe people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the, Lord, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our, our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul starts out this letter with his traditional greeting. Then he mentions why he's thankful for the Thessalonians, because their faith is growing, their love is increasing, and they're perse persevering, remaining faithful, and enduring persecutions and trials. He reminds the Thessalonians that they will be counted worthy of the kingdom, that God is in control, evil will be judged, and that God is coming back to judge and make things right. It's at this point that Paul petitions God in prayer for the Thessalonians in verse 11. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. So Paul's making two petitions in verse 11. First, that God would make the Thessalonians worthy of his calling. Remember, Paul is writing to Thessalonian Christians, so this calling or invitation is not an invitation to be saved for the intended audience is already saved. Um, and we know we are not worthy of salvation, but come naked and impoverished to the foot of the cross and can boast only in Christ's work and not in our own merits. So what does Paul mean when he prays for the Thessalonians to be worthy of his calling? Um, in praying with Paul, D.A. Carson writes, that means these believers must grow in all the things that please God so that he is pleased with them and finally judges them to be living to the calling that they have received. So Ephesians 4.1 comes to mind, life, live a, a life worthy of the calling you've received. This sounds kind of like sanctification, where we're you know, to grow in wisdom and are conformed by Christ day by day. The second petition Paul prays in this letter, or in the latter part of the verse 11, is that by his power, God may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Ideally here, Paul is praying that the Thessalonians would put their faith into practice by actually living out the gospel. Again, before we were saved, our primary goal was to please ourselves, our desires, our ends. Paul is praying here that the Thessalonians would be conformed or transformed to desire the things of God. Instead of thinking about our own, their own interests, Paul is praying that their initial response or thoughts would be focused on furthering the gospel and loving and serving others, all for the larger purpose of glorifying Christ, as we will read in verse 12. Putting others above ourselves, a transformation from selfish ambition to selfless, humble service, and again, with that larger overall and general purpose of glorifying Christ in all that we do. So Paul closes this section in verse 12 with this. We pray this so that the name of the Lord may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Carson writes that the first part is common enough. We pray this so that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. For Paul, his concern that Christians might be counted worthy of their calling and his deep desire that God might fulfill their good and faith prompted purposes can never be the ultimate ends. They are only proximate ends. The ultimate end is that the Lord Jesus be glorified in consequence of such growing maturity and fruitfulness on the part of believers. The Christian's whole desire at its best and highest is that Jesus Christ be praised. Regarding that second part of the verse where Paul seems to be seeking glorification of believers, where he says, we pray this so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. We're going to look at that you and him part. It would seem here that Paul is speaking to the Christians' justification, sanctification, and final glorification. Though we're not yet glorified, untainted, and without sin, we are on that sanctification journey in this earthly life with the knowledge that complete glorification comes in the end on account of what Christ did for us on the cross. Now we're going to look at Paul's prayers 
for the Thessalonians, but this time in 1 Thessalonians 3, 9 through 13. So I'm going to read there. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with his, all of his holy ones. Again, according to a f- few verses prior to this reading, Paul reports that he has been and is trying to come back and see the, Th- the Thessalonians. In lieu of Paul returning, he sent Timothy, and Timothy reported good news to Paul regarding the Thessalonians' faith and practices. Paul's elated that, they're having, they're, that they've stayed steadfast and true, and that is how Paul starts out his prayer, by thanking God for them and the joy that it brings that they're remaining faithful. Then in verse 11, Paul prays that he will... Get to, he prays that he will get to see them again soon. He also prays that the Lord would make their love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as Paul's does for him. He prays that their hearts would be strengthened so that they will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. We see that Paul has a deep desire to see the Thessalonians and is elated regarding reports that they're staying steadfast, but still there seems to be something more. I'm sure he'll find personal satisfaction and joy in seeing his friends he made again if and when he gets back to Thessalonica. You know what I meant. And he will likely find satisfaction that the gospel, when shared with the Thessalonians, did not come back void. But it doesn't stop there. Paul wants them to continue to improve even though they're doing well. Though they're loving well, he prays that their love would increase and overflow. He doesn't pray that they would do pretty good. He prays that they be blameless, not in the habit of sinning, and holy, set apart. All for the glory of Christ when he comes with all of his holy ones. Pretty Christ-focused. I'm not suggesting that praying for more material matters like your daughter's cold getting better or getting a promotion at work is bad or unworthy. But the thing that strikes me when I read through these verses of Paul is that regardless of what he prays for, there always seems to be a focus on what is best for Christ and his kingdom. And that seems like something to emulate and take notice of. Next, let's look at Colossians 1, 9 through 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Something interesting in these verses um, in Colossians is that Paul here is praying for folks he doesn't know. Paul founded founded and was familiar with the Thessalonian church, but the church in Colossae was set up by Epaphras, who was likely led to the Lord by Paul. Paul says they haven't stopped praying for them since hearing of them similar to how we pray regularly in the service for persecuted Christians in the universal church and missionaries throughout the globe who we've never met. We see Paul praying without ceasing and persistently like we are encouraged elsewhere. I don't imagine Paul is in a constant state of prayer in his prayer closet, but more likely persisting daily and regularly praying for the Colossians amongst other churches and things. Again, this attitude of moment to moment prayerful focus of steadfast, persistent, and continual prayer that we read about throughout scripture. And the verses just prior to this, verses 3 through 6, Paul thanks God for the things that he prays for in the verses we just read. We actually saw this same thing to a degree in both the Thessalonian passages that we just reviewed. But in verses 3 through 6 of Colossians, Paul thanks God regarding the faith and love of the Colossians and the fruit that is being produced as a result of their faith and love. Then in verses 9 through 14, Paul prays for the Colossians that God would fill them with the knowledge of his will so that they may 
live a life worthy of the Lord, that they will continue to grow and bear fruit, that they will be strengthened with the power through God, that they would be patient, endure, and be thankful. The Colossians, like the Thessalonians, were doing pretty good, and Paul is thankful for that. But Paul prays that they will do even better, not grow stagnant, not become content with where they are, but, he, but to always be growing in knowledge and wisdom. When things are bad, we often fall on our knees to pray, which we should, but when things are good, I think we can learn here that being thankful and praying for the excellent to become more excellent is always is also called for and oftentimes overlooked. Remember, we should never be done growing, and we should always be thankful. Throughout these verses, we see Paul asking God to fill the believers with the knowledge of his will so that they might be utterly pleasing to him. Do we think Paul is here speaking of seeking God's will regarding who they'll marry, what job they'll take, what shoes or sandals they should wear to the interview? I doubt it. So consider like Romans 12.2. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Or Thessalonians 1, 4 through 3. It is the will of God that you should be sanctified. Or 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 through, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. These three sets of verses seem to clear up what God's will is for us and what we can do to utterly please him. Do not conform to the world, but to Christ. Grow and become more like Jesus. Pray continually and be thankful. And here in Colossians, we see a similar list of things we can do related to God's will for our life and ways in which we can utterly please him. Bear fruit in every good work. Grow in the knowledge of God. Display great endurance and patience. Pray and joyfully give thanks to the Father. This isn't exhaustive, but should help when wrestling with how we might please God and do his will. Bear fruit. Grow in the knowledge of him. Endure and be patient. And pray and give thanks. A real focus on serving the Lord, growing in the knowledge of God, and a patient and thankful heart, things that transform and glorify, transform us and glorify Christ. Finally, let's look at Philippians 1, 9 through 11. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul prays for growth in love and knowledge and insight in the Philippians, but why? So that they'll be able to outspart the naysayers, so that they can be puffed up with knowledge, so that they will win every argument? No, he says, so that they may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Again, quite a, a, quite a Christ focus. Going back to what we learned about the Thessalonians, where Paul boasted in their perseverance and persecution, Paul's remedy or solace for them and their persecution was something like this. Hey, I'm so proud of you for standing firm in this persecution, but just know that you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for, for which you are suffering when you die, which looks like it might be soon based on how things are going. But remember, God is just and relief will come when Jesus comes back to judge. Or read another way, yeah, this really stinks, but stand firm. God will take care of this in time. You may be martyred in the meantime, but it's all going to work out fine in the end because God is in control of this whole thing and Christ will be glorified. So is this our attitude? We are here with one main purpose in the end, to glorify Christ. That is in the way we live, the way we grow, pray, play, eat, drink, party, raise our families, work, recreate, interact with others, how we respond to sin's opportunity, and even in the way we die. The purpose and goal of it all is to conform to be more like Christ and for Christ to be glorified. And this is exactly what we see in the latter bits of Paul's prayer to the Philippians, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of, of God. So to close, I've compiled a list of things that Paul prays for in these four sections of scripture we've reviewed today. Here they are. He prays that they would be worthy of their calling. 
He prays that God would bring to fruition their desire for goodness and every deed prompted by faith. He prays that Christ would be glorified. He prays that their love would increase, even when they're doing pretty well in that area already. He prays that their hearts would be strengthened and that they would be blameless, not in the habit of sinning and holy, set apart. He prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of God. He prays that they live lives worthy of the Lord. He prays that, the, that they continue to grow and bear fruit. He prays that they'll be patient, endure, and be thankful. So here's a simplified breakdown. He prays that they be worthy. He prays for spiritual growth. He prays that Christ be glorified. He prays for love to increase. He prays that they be blameless and holy. He prays that they be filled with knowledge of God, the knowledge of God. He prays that they be patient, endure, enduring, and thankful. What do we see here? What does Paul deem important to pray for? Do our prayers look similar some of the time, most of the time, rarely, should they? Again, again, let's look at it again one last time. Paul prays that they be worthy, that they be filled with the knowledge of God, that they be blameless, not in the habit of sitting, and holy, set apart, and that they grow spiritually. These go hand in hand and hand in hand. I guess there's four hands in this analogy. Um, remember to be holy, blameless, filled with the knowledge of God, and worthy of our calling involves believers growing in the areas that please God, living a life worthy of the calling we have received, like we read earlier in Ephesians, becoming more like Jesus as we are sanctified day by day. And I think it's important to remember that it's very hard to do this if you're not daily in the word, prayer, and in study. Paul prays that Christ be glorified. Remember, this is the ultimate goal in all that we do, literally everything that we do. It's not about us. It's, not about, it's about glorifying Christ and God's will being done. Paul prays for love to increase. Again, this idea of selfless servitude, forgiveness, humility, putting others above ourselves, and sacrifice. And finally, Paul prays that they be patient, enduring, and thankful. Patient, patience and endurance as we wait for God to make our, all things right, and gratitude that the transcendent God of the universe would think of us and make himself and his ways known, that he would grant us salvation and bless us abundantly, protect us like a good shepherd, and love us perfectly. And to boot, he allows us the incredible opportunity and privilege to be a part of allowing us to pray for his very perfect will to be done.